Uh, my name is Chris Sandoval. I am the resident church planner here at the Resolve. Uh, the church is training and assessing me and hopefully sending me out to plant a church with my lovely wife, Carrie Ann. Go ahead and raise your hand. No? Okay. <laughs> she will not raise that hand. Uh, and some of you guys, some of you guys, if you're interested uh, in this church plant, the idea of it, uh, make sure to find me after service. I'd love to answer some of those questions for you. We're looking to plant on the south side of the city, on the south side of the city. Just ask me after the service if you have any questions. So I don't know if you guys remember this. Do any of you guys remember the game called Life? You guys remember that game? Yeah? Isn't it sweet? Like if you, if, if, if you or your kids didn't feel enough pressure already to succeed and be winners at the game of life, now there's a board game that you get to fail at as well. Isn't that super sweet? I remember that game. And like the whole family's involved. Um, I remember that the tagline from the commercial says, be a winner at the game of life. Be a winner at the game of life. We live in such, uh, in such an intense world where we're constantly being told that we have to be better and smarter and stronger and faster. You have to be awesome at everything. You have to be better than everyone. You have to be winning every day. And this kind of incessant desire to win and to, to constantly be number one, I think is, is so well expressed and captured, um, and some of you guys will remember this from the retreat, captured by that classic song from Cake, The Distance. Cake, The Distance. I don't know. Let me, let me remind you of the lyrics. Reluctantly crouched at the starting line, engines pumping and thumping in time. The green light flashes, they yearn, uh, the flags go up, churning and burning, they yearn for the cup. They deftly maneuver for muscle and rank, fuel burning fast on an empty tank, reckless and wild. They pour through the turns, their prowess is potent and secretly stern. As they speed through the finish, the flags go down, the fans get up and they get out of town. The arena is empty except for one man still driving and striving as fast as he can. The sun has gone down and the moon has come up. And long ago somebody left with the cup, but he's driving and striving and hugging the turns and thinking of someone for whom he still burns. He's going the distance. He's going for speed. She's all alone in her time of need. Because he's racing and pacing and plotting the course, he's fighting and biting and riding on his horse, he's going the distance. I love that song because I actually remember when it came out, um, but also because it just captures in me, and I think in all of us, how much we just keep going, even after the race is done. We're still trying to be number one. In today's passage in Mark, Chapter 10, 35 through 40, we find two of Jesus' disciples with that same kind of incessant desire to be number one. They are so, so consumed by being winners at the game of life. And today, really, as we look at them, um, I hope two things for us. One is that we would recognize that we, along with these two disciples, have what I'm calling today is, uh, greatness problems or issues, that we have problems with this idea of greatness. But secondly, and more importantly, I hope that today you and I would leave this place as those that not only have greatness problems, but that we trust and that we believe in the greatness of Jesus, in the greatness of Jesus. So let's go ahead and read Mark chapter 10, 35 through 40. All right. All right. Mark chapter 10, 35 through 45. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left 
in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism uh, with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit in my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. and Their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for bringing us here this morning. Father, we thank you that your word captures for us in the stories of others, our own struggles, our own desires, Father, our own fears. We thank you that today as we look at the story of James, John, and Jesus, Father, that we would know that you know us and that we would know Jesus more fully, more greatly today. Father, we ask that you would open up our minds and our ears and our hearts to receive what only you can give us. We pray that you would give us grace this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, last week, Pastor Dwayne did a great job of introducing us to one of the most famous disciples of Jesus. His name is Peter. If you, you guys remember that story, it's a great Uh, story of Jesus redeeming this knucklehead and making him a church leader and then going back to him and breaking him and building him back up. Today, we're looking at two other of Jesus's disciples. Uh, They are, uh, as you gathered from the reading, James and John. Now, very quickly, just in case you guys are reading through the book of Mark or you're reading through the book of Acts and then Galatians, very quickly, the James and John who are in this passage Uh, This James in Mark 10 is not to be confused with another of the 12 apostles whose name uh, name is also James. His dad was Alphaeus. And this is not the James that is the brother of Jesus who's mentioned uh, in the book of Galatians that Pastor Duane has been going through. Um, This James is not the author of the book of James in your Bible. That's also uh, James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, The John in Mark chapter 10, this is not John the Baptist, um, and it's not this other guy named John Mark who ends up actually writing the book of Mark, all right? Uh, I know it's a little confusing, but it's interesting. As I was going through this passage and I started just doing some research on these two guys, James and John, I realized there are a lot of guys in the New uh, Testament named James and a lot of other ones named John. So who are these two guys in the book? Of Mark in Mark chapter 10. Well, first of all, we need to know that they are brothers. Their father is a man named Zebedee, Duda. Excuse me. Um, their father's name is Zebedee. Their mother, uh, Salome, uh, was Jesus' aunt, which makes this James and this John cousins of Jesus, right? good chance they grew up knowing about Jesus, knowing that he was supposed to be someone famous, maybe hung out with him the summers by the Sea of Galilee. So they're family, right? They're family. What's uh, interesting here is not only are they family, but then when Jesus finally uh, starts his public ministry, he was 30, he he waited till he was 30 to start his ministry. When Jesus uh, starts his ministry, James and John are actually the first one of the first two guys that Jesus specifically selects to be his disciples. All right? So here's Jesus. 
And he's not just letting anyone follow him. He specifically selects James and John right after Peter and Andrew to be his disciples. And then if you read a little bit further in the book of Mark and the other Gospels, you'll see that that Jesus then calls the twelve and he says, not only are you my disciples, but I'm going to call you apostles. You will be the founders and leaders of the future church. And if that wasn't awesome enough, Jesus already has an entourage of 12. He's given them a specific title of apostles. But then he selects Peter, James, and John to be in a closer inner circle. If you read the Gospel accounts, you'll see that Jesus picks Peter, James, and John to, to go witness the healing of this little girl, brings her back from the dead. Jesus also selects Peter, James, and John to momentarily witness Jesus' heavenly and divine glory in something uh, that the Bible calls the transfiguration, where he was, Jesus was transfigured. And then, even at the end of Jesus' ministry, the night before he is crucified and he knows it's coming, Jesus picks Peter, James, and John to specifically pray with him. So these guys are close. These guys are super close to Jesus. By Mark 10, however, James and John, this kind of closeness to Jesus has gotten to their heads. And so by Mark 10, they start thinking that being Jesus' disciples, apostles, and close friends is not just a privilege and an honor, but it's their exclusive and their elite right to be this close to Jesus. How do I know this? How do I know that James and John were treating their closeness to Jesus as like a members-only, cool kids club-only kind of thing. Well, if you were to read in Mark chapter 9, the the chapter right before uh, the passage that we read, um, John, who I think a lot of times we think John is this kind of meek and mild kind of guy, John comes up to Jesus, hey, Jesus, 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 I saw this guy over there And he was like casting out demons, but he's not in our club. He's not in our club, Jesus. Can we stop him? Let me stop him, Jesus, right? Jesus says, dude, dude, chill out. Chill out, all right? So he flat out rebukes him. If you go to the book of Luke, Luke 9 tells us another story. This time, John with his brother James are traveling with Jesus. They get to a town. The other disciples try to go find a place. They come back and say, Jesus, no one wants to put us up for the night. No one wants us to couch surf with them. All right? What did James and John do? Well, there's a reason Jesus gave them the nickname Sons of Thunder. Because here James and John say, hey, Jesus, Jesus, can we call fire down from heaven to destroy this town? Right? Like These guys are thinking, man, do they know who we are? We're the Jesus crew, man. You can't say no to us. They want to call down fire from heaven. Jesus is like, dude, chill out. Chill out. We'll go somewhere else. So it's in their head that they, uh, it, it's their right. It's um, something that they deserve, right? And then to make things worse, by Mark chapter 10, by the time we get to verse 35, Jesus is already walking with his disciples. They are on this uh, um, epic journey to go to Jerusalem. What's Jerusalem about? Well, Jerusalem is where the disciples, and it's about everyone else who is following Jesus at that point, Jerusalem is where everyone thinks that Jesus is finally going to be a crowned and be victorious over the Romans and over all the enemies of God's people, and he's going to be put on his throne and Everyone, uh, everything will be okay. And James and John with the other disciples are thinking, it's our time. This is it. Because as soon as Jesus gets crowned as Lord and Messiah and Christ, we're, it, it's going to be our turn. We're going to be the number two guy. So what do they do? By verse 35, where, which is where we pick up the story, they, they sneak away from the other ten. They, they go over to where Jesus is and they're like, hey, Jesus. Jesus, we want you to do, and uh, if we could put this up, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That's the uh, verse 35. And Jesus kind of goes along with this, and he says, okay, what do you want me to do? 
And then they say to Jesus, uh, grant us to sit at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. The audacity. You guys notice there is no question mark in anything that James and John say, right? They say, first of all, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. No question mark. It's not a request. It's a demand. And secondly, look what they, what they say. Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left. These are not, please, may I, this is right now, I give us whatever we ask. Grant us positions of power and praise, Jesus. And this is where we find the first problem, greatness problem that James and John have. And by the way, this, this part of the sermon is called uh, first or right and left, right and left. Problem number one with greatness that James and John have is what I think I deserve to be great. Basically, James and John are thinking, uh, their thinking went something like this. I'm chosen, I'm special, and I deserve to be great. God owes it to me. Now, before we get indignant with James and John, with the nerve, right? seriously, of all the things they could ask for, they could ask for uh, world peace, they could ask for the end of, end of hunger, but seriously, they said, and they're thinking basically, I deserve to be great. Jesus, make me great. Before we get indignant with them, are you, am I any better? If we're honest with ourselves, however we define greatness, happiness, wealth, health, beauty, are we any better than James and John? If I'm honest with you, a lot of times, my prayers, my requests to God go something like this. I get all holy and my, my most reverent voice, I go, dear God, I deserve to be great. Make me great right now. Amen. How, how many of your prayers are like that, honestly? You don't have to shout it out right now or raise your hand. But seriously, how many of our prayers goes something like that. I think I deserve to be great. God, make me great. Most of us Christians are not recognized that this kind of self-centered, vain, conceited attitude with a, a dash of delusion of grandeur is a problem. There's something wrong with that. Seriously, who, who wants to be friends with someone who's like that? It. Yeah, right. Some of you guys have been friends and, around, and been around people like that. They think they're the best thing ever and that they deserve it. The Bible not only confirms this attitude is a problem, but actually commands us, tells us not to have this kind of attitude. In Philippians 2, 3, this is what we're told. Do nothing from rivalry and conceit. Conceit. Basically, God is telling us it is not just a problem, it is sin for you and for me, for us to have this attitude of we deserve to be great, we deserve to be number one, and that God owes it to me. We'll come back to that little word rivalry in our next point, but for now, let me ask you this, how do we get rid of this attitude, this conceited, vain uh, a sense of entitlement attitude that we have? Here's the solution. Solution number one to the greatness problem is believe and trust in Jesus' greatness. Believe and trust in who Jesus is and what he did in his greatness and amazingly, somehow, you stop worrying about your own greatness. And that incessant desire to be number one will fade away. It's true. It's true. And that's it. That's the solution. Now, I'm going to go ahead and skip over verses 34 and 40, where Jesus talks about a cup and baptism. We'll get back to that at the end. 
But for now, I want us to just jump ahead a few verses to verse 42, where Jesus talks about another greatness problem that we have. And here, uh, we were talking about James wanting to be uh, right and left. Here, the other greatness problem can kind of be summarized like this, of being first and high. And by the end of the sermon, you'll see me do the Macarena, by the way. Um, So it was right and left, now it's first and high. What's going on here in verse uh, 42? We'll get to uh, that in a second. Um, Let me just say that when I say first and high, as a side note, I'm not talking about getting high. Uh, I'm talking about uh, being first before others and being high above others. So verse verse, uh, 42 says this. 42 and 43, and Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and that great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. It shall not be so among you. Jesus is saying that another greatness problem that you and I have is that we believe we have to be better than others in order to be great. Greatness problem number two, I believe I have to be better than everyone else if I'm going to be great. Again, it's that incessant desire um, that we've talked about already. This desire that I want to be first before others. I have to be the only winner and everyone else has to be a loser. I want everyone else to look at me, right? I want to have no one in front of me. Oh, I'm going to be honest with you. Again, um, this idea of having to be first comes out on a daily basis for me. And my wife will attest to this. It happens when I'm driving. All right? Show up to a a stop sign, a four-way stop sign. There is no way I'm going to get let that guy over there who got here a millisecond before me, there is no way I'm going to let him go in front of me, right? I'm not even going to look at him. I'm not even going to acknowledge him. He's not there. I'm going to go through the stop sign. It's up to me. There, there's no way I'm going to let that guy kind of skip ahead of everyone on the highway. You know what I'm talking about, right? Everyone's waiting on the highway. Everyone's in traffic. You look in your rear mirror, you see this guy just like going through the, what's it called, the median or the, the, the shoulder? You're like, there's no way he's going to do that. And swerve your car just a little bit over so he can't get in front of you or anyone else. Isn't it crazy how this desire to be first comes out? And obviously it comes out in other more subtle ways, maybe ways that we think no one else can see. What about this desire to be high above others? This desire that I have to be at the top and everyone else below me. I want everyone else to look up to me. I want no one else to be the center of attention except me. And again, here, if I'm honest with you guys, this comes up all the time. I want to, someday maybe, wouldn't it be cool if I could be like super celebrity and, and be on the cover of a magazine. Maybe, maybe someday I'll be able to, to make up a magazine like Oprah so that I can be on the cover every month like Oprah. Uh, you get these things in your head. We watch TV. We watch things like The Voice or other competitions on TV like uh, American Ninja. Like, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, wouldn't that be awesome if that would be me? It's, it's in our blood. And sometimes we try to justify this attitude by, by saying things like, well, God just made me with a competitive attitude. Right? Or I'm ambitious. I'm really ambitious. I'm the most uh, ambitious person I know. Right? Uh, but think about it. How much of our lives, how much of your lives, how much of my life is spent comparing ourselves with others? How much? How much of our time is spent and wasted believing that our greatness depends on being first and high compared to others? How much 
time do we waste being worried that, that someone out there is actually maybe better than us? That someone is just a little further ahead of us and higher than us, stronger and smarter and prettier. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Here again, uh, we're told, do nothing from rivalry and conceit. And there's the word rivalry. Because this idea, this desire to be first and high, really is thinking that you're in a competition with others. right? That everyone else is your opponent, your competitor. Basically, God says, it's a sin. It's wrong to go through life like that. And here's the greatness solution. Number two, you guys ready? Believe and trust. In Jesus' greatness. You guys catching on? Maybe a little theme? All right? Problem number two, I have to be better than others to be great. Jesus says, your solution to this problem is that you have to look to me. You have to believe and trust in me and my greatness and who I am and what I've done. And honestly... This idea of thinking, of constantly comparing yourself to others, it'll fade away. It'll fade away the more you focus on Jesus. And so if greatness isn't something we deserve from God and greatness is not defined or dependent on others, what is greatness? What is greatness? Jesus tells us, and that will get us to our next point, Jesus says, greatness is about being last and low. So I told you I danced in Macarena for you guys. So again, uh, greatness is not about being right or left. It's not about being first and high. It's about being last and low. Last and low. There you go. Last and low. Let's go ahead and, and, uh, and read those verses. Verse 43 through 44. Jesus says to them, But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Jesus is basically redefining greatness because seriously, who talks about greatness like this? It's not the way I think about greatness. I'm going to assume that it's not the way you think about greatness of being someone else's servant, please, they need to serve me. Of being someone else's slave, forget it. They're supposed to be my slaves, right? They're supposed to be my slaves. Jesus is saying, if you're going to be great, you have to commit to being last and low for others. To serve others before you serve yourself. To be attentive more attentive, more sensitive to the needs of others before your own needs. To commit your life to give it up for others, to give up your time and your money, your, uh, your energy and even your success so that others might be successful. That's what Jesus is saying. You have to commit yourself to love others sometimes even do things for them that they don't want to do, they can't do for themselves. That's what it means to be a servant, to be a slave, to love others, to willingly and happily make yourself last and low for their sake. Because it's not, it's not just like that you're being last and low so that others will say, oh, look how, how humble you are. What a great guy but you're being last and low for other people, for their sake, that they might somehow be lifted up, right? That they might be first ahead of you and higher than you. We go back to Philippians 2, 3, the verse we read before. It continues. It tells us more about how we should be great. Philippians 2, verses 3 and now through 4. We're told, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. 
let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Jesus here is defining greatness. He's defining greatness, but then that brings us to our third problem. The third problem is, I can't. I don't want to be great according to Jesus' standard. Isn't that really what's at the heart of all this? The heart of all our problems with greatness? I don't want to do it, Jesus. And I, I can't. I can't give up this incessant desire to be number one and be better than others. Because here's the truth. You and I don't have it in us to do this willingly and happily. It's not in us. Pastor Jack Miller, professor, church planner, author, and missionary, says it like this. Jesus is calling us to deny some basic things in our personality, things that need to die. I think that means dying to our fleshly love of impressing people in this way for glory, for ourselves. This is a struggle that is intense, like tearing the flesh off of your own bones. Let's be honest. This isn't easy. This last and low business, it's not easy. It is impossible. It's impossible because at the end of the day, we don't just want... We, we, it's not that we, we don't want to or that we, we can't be last and low for others. It's really because we don't want to be last and low compared to God. We don't want to put God in His rightful place of being first in our lives and high above us. We want to be in control. We want our will to be done. We want to be the center of attention, not Him. We don't want to submit to God. We don't want to commit to God. We don't want Him to be first and high in our lives. This is the greatest greatness problem that you and I have. That we can't. We don't want to be great according to Jesus' standard. So who or what can possibly change us? Who or what can motivate us to live for God and to live for others instead of ourselves? Who or what can exemplify this kind of greatness that is last and low? And who can perfectly, who, who out there can perfectly do this willingly and happily? The greatness problem that we have is that we can't and don't want to be great. The solution, I hope, you know by now, is this, is to believe and trust in the greatness of Jesus. The solution to that thing inside of you that will not submit, that will not commit to God, is to believe and trust in Jesus' greatness and, and what, he, what He has done for us and who He is. And man, if only there was a verse that told us that. If only there was like a short, brief, less than 25 words or less, little description about who Jesus is, how great He is, and what He's done for us. There it is, right? Verse 45. Verse 45 is the Gospel in 25 words or less. It's a super dense and packed, it's, it's like a protein bar or something. It's just packed with everything you need for the rest of your life. It tells us so much about Jesus and, and tells us that He is great because He served and sacrificed Himself for us. That's our last point. Serve and sacrifice. This is what Jesus says. For even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. Let me read that again. We'll, we'll go ahead and leave that up 
because we're gonna we're about to pick it apart. For even the Son of Man came not to serve or to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is basically saying this, and I'll unpack this in, in a minute. Jesus is saying that he is God, that he came to earth willingly, all right, and that he came to serve and sacrifice himself for us. Right? That's what he's saying. So let's dig in. Let's dig in. First of all, this phrase, son of man. This is actually Jesus' favorite term for himself. Uh, more often than not in the Gospels, when he's referring to himself, when he's referring to why he's here and who he is, he talks about himself with this term, son of man. And uh, we don't have time today, but if we did, we could go through the Old Testament and New Testament. And this is what we would find. Uh, find out about this term, Son of Man, and why Jesus is using it. By saying that He is the Son of Man, Jesus is actually claiming to be God, that He is eternal, all-powerful, and that He can forgive sins. I know it seems a little counterintuitive, but that's actually what's going on here. Jesus says, I am the Son of Man, which means I am divine. I am God. But He's also saying more. Jesus is saying that Not only is he God, but he is the human leader and savior of humanity. Sometimes called Messiah, sometimes called Christ. Jesus is saying, I am the man. I am the leader and the savior of humanity. And I have come to earth to live, to die, and to rise again. And then he also says this when he uses the term son of man. He's basically saying, I'm going to come back. I will have lived and died and rose again from the dead, but I will come back, and when I come back, I will bring eternal and universal justice. See, all that we need to know to know about Jesus' greatness is, is put right here in this little term, Son of Man. It tells us that He is, at the end of the day, first and high. It's a position that He's not... Uh, trying to gain for himself, it actually is who he is. He is first. He is high because he is God and he is the Savior of the world and he will come back to bring justice to this world. So the, the next part of this phrase makes this verse crazy. right? Because Jesus told us that he is first and high. There's no de- debating that. But then the reason that he came is is why? Not to be served, but to serve. He is first and high, but he says, oh, and by the way, I come to earth in order to be last and low. I want you to think about it like this. Every other God, every other God, whether it's a God in an institutional religion or any other God, that we create on our own. Every other God requires and demands service from us from us, and nothing less. Think about it. All other gods will tell you, you have to serve me, period. Jesus is the only God who says, yeah, you have to serve me, but I came to earth. I came to you to serve you. This is radical. This is something that you won't find anywhere else. This is the truth. That Jesus came to serve us. Because only Jesus loves us enough to willingly and perfectly serve us and to perfectly become last and low for us and in our place. And then Jesus tells us how he did that. Jesus tells us how he became last and low with the last phrase there. He says that he became last and low by giving his life as a ransom for many. He died for us. He sacrificed his love, his life for us as our substitute. This servant-like death and slave-like sacrifice is actually what Jesus was talking about earlier in the verses that we skipped, this idea of a cup and of a baptism. It's 
it's Jesus' way of saying, I'm going to give up my life for you. I'm going to do something that you can't do. It's something I'm going to have to do out of love for you. We go back to Philippians chapter 2 and we read the rest of the verses that follow the verses that, that we read about not being conceited or, or uh, doing things out of rivalry. This is what Philippians 2 tells us. If we can go there right now. Let's see. All right. Do nothing from rivalry and conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And if we skip ahead uh, to verses 6 through 8, this is what we find because we're being called to focus on Jesus. And verses 6 through 8 says this, talking about Jesus, says, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But Jesus made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's how Jesus became last and low for us, for you, and for me. What motivates this kind of radical, crazy love, this, this death? It is pure love. It is real love that motivates Jesus and motivated Him to be last and low for us, even though He was first and high. Tim Keller says this, it had to be this way. It had to be this way because all life-changing love is a substitutionary sacrifice. Think about it. If you ever try to love somebody who has needs, someone who is in trouble or who is persecuted or emotionally wounded, it's going to cost you. You can't love them without taking a hit yourself. A transfer of some kind is required so that somehow their troubles, their problems, transfer to you. Some of your fullness is going to have to go into them, and you have to empty out to some degree. We know from experience, from the mundane to the dramatic, that sacrifice is at the heart of real love. And we know that nobody who has ever done anything that made a difference for us, a parent, a teacher, a mentor, or a friend, or a spouse, we know that they sacrificed in some way, stepped in and accepted some hardship so that we would not get hit with it ourselves. Therefore, it makes sense that God, that a God who comes into the world to deal with the ultimate evil, the ultimate sin, would have to make a substitutionary sacrifice. Even we flawed human beings know, says Keller, that you can't just overlook evil. It can't be dealt with, removed, or healed just by saying, forget it. It must be paid for. And dealing with it is costly. The debt had to be paid. But he was so incredibly loving that he was willing to die in order to do it himself. The cross, says Keller, is the self-substitution of God. The self-substitution of God who is first and high. He came to be last and low for you, for me. People who are incessantly driven by being great, by being better than others. This, this Savior, this God came to serve us and to give up His life for us. Can that kind of love transform first and high people like you and me? Does it work? Did it work for James and John? It did. It did. Because after Jesus died and, and after He rose again from the dead, 
And he showed James and John that he is great and he has done great things for them by taking their place. John, or I'm sorry, James would go on and without even thinking about himself or his life, he would go on to boldly proclaim the gospel and proclaim the greatness of Jesus. He became the first apostle to be martyred. Acts chapter 12. James, after seeing the greatness of Jesus, made himself last and low and became the first apostle to die for Jesus. And his brother John, his brother John actually lived a long life, lived longer than any of the other twelve. What did he do? Because he knew the greatness of Jesus, he would go on to write books and letters that we find in our Bible today that testify to the greatness of Jesus and not to himself. And John, in these books and these letters, he doesn't even, uh, he doesn't even refer to himself by name. Go through the book of John that he wrote. He doesn't even call himself by name or in his letters. The only time he calls himself by name is in the last book that he wrote which is the book of Revelation. And in that book, John says, I, John, and he says he is the servant of Jesus Christ. He is the brother of persecuted Christians. And he is the partner of other Christians who have put themselves last and low. Can the greatness of Jesus transform us? can't. You and me this morning, if you're not yet a Christian, if you're not yet a Christian, Jesus is calling you to believe and to trust in His greatness. Jesus is calling you to honestly admit that you have a first and high sense of entitlement and that it is sin. Jesus is calling you to wholeheartedly trust in His greatness. To depend on it. Jesus is calling you to humbly receive His last and low service and sacrifice for you. Will you receive that service and that sacrifice from Jesus? Will you confess that He is first and high? Will you submit Will you commit to this Savior? And today, if you're already a Christian, Jesus is calling you to continue to believe and to trust in Him. To focus on His greatness as you follow Him in being last and low. Jesus and what He did for us can transform us. It can transform first and high people like you and me. Because He first became last and low for us. Let's pray.